Colleen, we're here at a beautiful property called Rockbank, which has walls dating back 170 years. You play a really important role at the city of Whittlesea with particular regard to heritage. Let's talk about the heritage of how these walls were constructed. How did they come to be? Well, this was one of the earliest areas, one of two, first available for purchase. The other is uh, in the Geelong area, north and west of Geelong. In 1838, land was available here for purchase. And very quickly, people took up the opportunity to buy some of these beautiful properties like Rock Lake. Um, of course, one of the first things that they had to do was think about how they were going to contain their stock. Here in Whittlesea, and right up to the South Australia border, is the Great Victorian Volcanic Plain. And that means that all this area is underlain by basalt. And you'll see in some areas here and across Whittlesea, the basalt is at the surface. It means that lots and lots of paddock rock is available. Convenient, free, to build dry stone walls. A lot of families who came here were Scottish, Irish, English, and here in Whittlesea, interesting German families. They brought with them the skills from the old country about building walls, but there were also itinerant professional wall builders. And they went around and offered their services, and many of the really beautiful walls in Whittlesea are built by professional wallers. It's extraordinary to see them still in use today for the very function they were developed for. In Victoria, how do we go about protecting these walls? Well, it's great that you say still in use because they are still standing. Isn't that testament to the skills of the wall builders? We have so many hundreds, in fact, of intact walls in Middlesea. They are still used today. Uh, we have a rural farm zone and here at Rock Bank it's a good example of how these walls are still the paddock walls, uh, the horse yard walls, the walls to keep stock out of orchards and gardens, uh, away from streams and rivers where they could wade in and you know foul themselves, off some of the really prominent stony outcrops here. Those are still in use today and on a property like this where there are Angus cattle it's keeping those cattle in the places they're supposed to be. Now, for anyone who is responsible for a dry stone wall and they have any intention to adapt it um, or any changes need to be made to it, a dry stone wall management plan is essential, but you can't just submit one and have it approved straight away. Lots of mistakes are made along the way. What are the sorts of errors you see in these dry stone wall management plans? That's right. At Whittlesea, um, and at the cities of Melton and Wyndham, we have local policies and we have requirements. Um, the legislation in Clause 5233 in the State Planning work Framework says that anyone who proposes to alter a dry stone wall in any way must apply for a permit. So all dry stone walls in Victoria are protected by Clause 5233. It means in Whittlesea and in the other municipalities that we need to require um, a permit to do any works that affect a dry stone wall, and we ask for a dry stone wall management plan. And the management plan does a couple of things. It identifies what the proposed impacts are going to be on the wall. Some of them are significant. If you're putting in a housing development, we recognize that you have to put in roads and uh, gates and footpaths. And sometimes that means portions of walls have to be removed, and we understand that but we also aim to conserve as many walls as possible in situ. The Dry Stone Wall Management Plan has to talk about the proposed impacts and then um, what's the history of the wall. So a wall on a property or several walls on a property, you need to do the historical research that says who built that, when did they build it, um, and we need to also know that you've checked original archival sources. And you hand that in to us and we then look at it and decide whether or not it's an appropriate dress and wall, wall management plan. However, what we find is people don't do the right research. They also don't record the walls properly. So you have to record them, measure them, do some drawings, take some photographs. If we are going to let you take out a portion of a wall, we need to have a record of what was there before we allowed you to demolish it. We have found that people don't understand the borough charter, nor do they use it, and they think that condition is an appropriate assessment of a dry stone wall. 
So dry stone walls have been standing for 170 years and some of them are not perfectly intact. They haven't been maintained. They might be on quite unconsolidated ground, maybe a little swampy, a little wet, and they sort of bleed off to the edges. Condition is not a signifier of significance. So we get a dry stone wall management plan that might say, oh, these walls are degraded so they can be removed. Mm -mm, sorry, we don't accept condition as a signifier of significance. Inside the dry stone wall toolkit, you can find a step-by-step -step guide for preparing your dry stone wall management plan. There's also a guide for assessing a dry stone wall management plan. Colleen, thank you so much for sharing your passion and professional love of dry stone walls. It's a pleasure.